those who are listening online, welcome as well. Uh, just a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, we'd ask you to pray for Pastor Rob. Um, he's actually in the hospital this morning. Um, he has an elevated white blood cell count, so they're keeping him for observation. So I uh, would just ask that you would pray for him. Um, obviously, he's our pastor. We love him, and he's always there for us, and so we want to pray for him as well. Um, if you do have questions about how he's doing, we just ask you to reach out to either Jenny or Jonathan, um, and they can fill you in on how he's doing. Uh, we're thankful for Brother Jonathan today. He was set to preach, and so the Lord knew that uh, Pastor would not be available this morning, so we prepared Brother Jonathan. We're thankful for that. We'd ask you to pray for those in our church who have needs, thinking of uh, Ray and Linda, Brother Ron, um, Elaine's sister, I think of Teresa's sister, Joanne, um, and many others who have needs, and we just ask that you would keep them in your prayers. So I heard a pastor say that the Christian life isn't hard. It isn't difficult. It's impossible. And folks, we cannot live the Christian life by our own power. I read this verse this morning uh, in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, and it simply says this, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord Almighty. You know, as Christians, we need to be filled with the Spirit every day. When you're saved, the Scripture says that you receive the Holy Spirit as part of your salvation. But we have to walk in the Spirit day by day. And so that's our responsibility as Christians. And that's the joy that we have, is to be filled with the Spirit each day. So we're going to take a moment to pray and lift up those in need and ask God's Spirit to fill us today. So let's pray. Well, Father God, thank you that we can come to you in prayer and that you hear our prayers. And thank you, Lord, that you know everything we need before we even ask. And thank you, Lord, that we can pray to you and we can come to you as Father God, as Jesus the Son, and as the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. God, thank you that you know all things and you know what's best for us. Um, Lord, we thank you for our church. We thank you for those who are in attendance today. Thank you for those who are listening online, Lord, and pray that they would be touched by you today. Lord, that you would speak to them um, through Jonathan and through your word and help them to grow closer to you. Lord, we lift up our pastor to you this morning, Lord. We thank you for him and his servant's heart. God, we pray that you would meet his needs right now, that you would um, give wisdom to those in the hospital to know best how to treat him. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort his family members, comfort Sheila and his children, and help them to know that he's in your hands, Father. We lift up those also in our church who are sick and are, are in need of healing. Think of Ray and Linda and Brother Ron. Lord, think of um, Joanne and pray, God, that you would meet her needs today. And Lord, all the other unspoken requests, we bring them to you now. Lord God, we just give you thanks and praise for this day. Help us to lift our hearts in worship to you, for you are worthy. In Christ's name, amen. All right, if you would please open your songbooks. We're going to start with number 410, Standing on the Promises. Please stand. 410, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. 
Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I now can see. Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. All right, verse 5. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Lisa, do you want to put your special?
Okay, if you have your songbooks, please pay, turn to page 815 to the doxology. And we'll receive our worship through our giving. I believe uh, Brother Phil's offered to volunteer to be an usher. If, Tom, if you wouldn't mind ushering as well. Page 815, as we all stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Brother Phil, can you say a prayer for our offering, please? And then there's no last congregational yeah. message. Oh, okay. Do you want me to or do you want to leave? Um, no, you have to leave the second. Okay, so just, just give me I a second. I will pray, I will pray, and then you come up and I will pray. All right, all right. I got it. Sin. Thank you. Well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn them to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter number 7. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the last book in the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and locate verse 17. It's good to um, be with everyone today. It's good to be uh, preaching and um I count it a privilege, I always do, and even in times like this where it feels like things are a little off, because I don't know about you guys, but I miss hearing my dad's voice when we're singing. Not to say that you guys don't have good voices, but I miss that booming voice that I usually uh, hear, and um, that I know that so many people, so many part, parts of our church and the people are at home online, and we miss you. And so it's almost like coming to church. If you want to see what it's like in the twilight zone, here it is, right? Um, so let us, with the best that we can, push this aside and focus on God's word this morning. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, we begin in verse 17. And as we re read, remember that this is the word of God. If thou shalt say in thine heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shalt remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt, the great temptations which thine eyes saw, and the signs, and the wonders, and the mighty hand, and the stretched out arm, whereby the Lord thy God wrought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them until they, they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed. Thou shalt not be frightened of them, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. 
and the, the Lord thy God will put out these nations before thee little by little, that thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. And let's pray and ask God's blessing upon his word. Now, Father God, now we humble ourselves before you as the great king of all. And Lord, we know that there is no inch of this planet or in everything that you've created whereby you are not claiming your authority over it. Father, we know that you've created everything that we see around us for your glory. Father, that you've made us a people for your glory, that you might be magnified in what you, you do so that we might look at ourselves, look at the people that we are next to, so that we might go outside and see nature, the beauty of what you've created, and bless your name for what you do so marvelously. And now, Father, I pray that as we turn to your word, that you would use me to do an impossible task, and that is to bring an accurate picture of you Lord, I feel so inadequate. Who am I to describe you and to tell these people what you're like? The sense of inadequacy that I feel is overbearing. And so, Father, despite my weakness, my frail mind, I ask, Father, that you, you would use me to step out of the way, so to speak, and let your, your people see you as clearly as you will let us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I think it goes without saying that there are certain times in our lives when we're more prone to anxiety, more prone to fearfulness. Um, there's a If there's ever a time really um, that our anxieties and our fears tend to intensify, it's during times of transition or times of change, right? Um, I remember as uh, a young person, I'm sure you do too, that returning back to school after summer break, just the, the sense of anxiety that I know that I felt with my, as I'd walked into that classroom for the first time with my palms being sweaty and my heart fluttering a little bit. It's because these times of transition, these times of change, they open a gateway to the unknown. And what we don't know scares us. And what we don't know makes us anxious. Well, in the text before us, we see that the people of God were really no different than we are. Because it was at this period in their lives, this period of time in their lives, where they too were living in a time of change. You'll notice in the text that we just read in verse 18, you'll see that you shall not be afraid. Verse 19 at the very, uh, at the very end, all the people of whom you are afraid. And then in verse 21, you shall not be frightened. You see, they also were afraid. Now, at this particular moment in history, you must remember that God had promised that his people, that one day that they would have a home for themselves in their own land. And after he had promised that, if you fast forward, you see that they are slaves in Egypt. And after you see the Exodus, you see that they are wandering in the desert for 40 years. And finally, as we open the book of Deuteronomy, we see that the time had come where they would step foot in the land. And as they are on the verge of entering this land, they enter it in a state of fear. Mainly because you'll notice that every time the word fear is connected, that it's always in, in regards to people that don't be afraid of them. Don't be frightened of them. You see, because they know that to get their land, God has ordained that they must fight for it. And I will cut off anyone who wants to raise the issue, um, atheists and uh, people who might challenge Christianity, that to say that God was ordaining genocide in this incident. I will direct you to um, Leviticus 18, Deuteronomy 12, and Genesis 15, 16 to look for yourself. That this is, that God has pronounced uh, his justice upon this, these people groups, and he is using his people to carry about his justice. And at the same time, these people would receive a land for themselves. And so Deuteronomy 
is if you like a record of Moses preparing his people for life in the new land. And in this particular section, Moses is dealing with their fear. You'll notice that in verse 18, he calls them to remember what God did to Pharaoh. In other words, he essentially says that when you fear, it's because you've forgotten. So he says, remember what God did to Pharaoh. And then he reminds them in verse 21, he says, he says don't only re remember about Egypt, but he also says, remember this, that God is not some distant God far off in the cosmos that you have no connection to. No, he is a mighty God and he's awesome and he is among you. And so God, so Moses is preparing his people to deal, deal with this fear. But in verse 22, this is what I'd like to call your attention to. Because Moses, it seems, seems to shift gears a little bit and actually talk about strategy when it comes to moving into their new land. Notice what he says, and again, I ask you to keep this in mind. And the Lord your God will put out, or he will drive out those nations before you little by little, that you may not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon you. That, I submit to you, is a really important statement. Because in this statement, God is, so to speak, telling them and us how he works. That is, that although he would work through miraculous means, right? Means and mir miracles that are dramatic and instantaneous and unmistakably a God thing. God says, I'm actually not going to work like that. I'm actually going to work only a little bit at a time and it'll be a step at a time it'll be very subtle and it'll be slow that's how i'm going to work and with us facing all these this new year with all the possibilities and challenges that are going to uh, await us i want to remind you of that simple fact that god works little by little and so what I want to do is basically just show you what this means for God and then what this means for us. So the first half will be like a lot of doctrine, like understanding who God is. And then at the end, I want to uh, like say, okay, what is this? How is this going to change my life? So first of all, what does this mean about God? Well, when we look at the Bible, especially when we're interpreting the Bible, it's always helpful. As I say, it's the safest approach to side with the reformers and interpret the Bible with the Bible. In other words, it's so easy that when we're reading the Bible, we're, we, we often try to make it say something that it's not, and we draw some unhelpful conclusions. And so if we use, if we're going to interpret the Bible, we need to keep this in mind, that context is king. Context is king. And what I mean by that is, instead of us imposing our thoughts on the text, we should actually look at what the text is saying and all around it. So when we study, we look at um, the areas, the, the chapters before and after a certain statement, which I did. And then we look at the whole of the book, that of the Bible, that that particular statement's in. And then what we do is we compare that statement with the rest of the Bible, and then we understand what it means. And if we bring that method of study to bear upon this verse, and I have, and I'll invite you to do it to, to, on your own to see that I'm not wrong. You will see that Moses is impressing upon the minds of his people three realities about God in verse 22. Number one, God is personal. You'll see the, in verse 22, what does it say? The Lord, your God, that he is a personal God. And you'll see here in, in Deuteronomy 7, notice that in verse 6, it says that God has chosen a people for himself. That in verse 9, that within the context of this covenant, this, this relationship that he was have with his people, that he would bless them. Verse 10, notice that he also says, I repay to the face those who hate me. And it's a picture of a, of a God who belongs to his people and conversely who the people belong to that God. There's a mutual belonging here. God has chosen us because we are holy, to be holy, he's, it says, and because of that we now belong to him by faith. 
And even as creator, God is said to give even those who are outside of his covenant, outside of his relationship with him, he blesses them with what's called common grace. Meaning you don't have to receive the be a part of that covenant to even receive the blessing of God. That God is good to all. He is, Jesus says, he makes the rain to shine, to, to, the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. And so God visits his creation with even common grace. He's involved in a- animal life, plant life. It's a picture of a globe and a people who God makes to magnify him. Because he's a personal God, the Lord, your God. But then not only that, not only is he a personal God, it says that he's a powerful God. He says, we'll drive those nations out before you little by little. It speaks of his power. You see here, um, he's talking about God being stronger than nations. And in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 17, it says, all nations before him are as nothing, And here we see that Yahweh, God, would empower his people and through the power that he supplies that they would actually have victory in battle. So he's a powerful God. He's a personal God. And then notice the rest of the verse. It'll be little by little. Why? Because the beasts, the animals of the field would grow on you. In other words, I am not going to work so fast that the animals, the animal life there, that there would be a vacuum effect because there would be no people there. And all this vast openness would invite animals to be, create their habitats there and you would be overrun by animals. And interestingly, I was, when I was studying this, I found out that Palestine, this area, was actually home to some really vicious animals. Did you know that there was a, a, a type of cheetah and a type of lion that, was, that lived there at this time? The Asiatic cheetah and the Asiatic lion. Then there's one that's on the verge of extinction that, lived, uh, that was uh, populated there. It's called the Syrian brown bear. Then there was the Levant viper, which was highly venomous. And then they had Nile crocodiles. And so God is saying here in this picture, if you'll see it, but he says, I am a personal God, I am a powerful God, and I'm a purposeful God. You can't go beyond my boundaries because there's purpose in it. And in this, God is saying this. He's saying, I am your God. I have chosen you to belong to me, and you do belong to me. And I will drive out these nations before you, But I will only do it little by little because if I do it too fast, I would have rescued you from Egypt and protected you in 40 days and 40 years in the desert only to have you get to the land and be threatened by vicious animals. Do you see? He is a personal God. He is a powerful God. And he's a purposeful God. And so because of who God is being personal, you're going to hear this a lot, personal, powerful, and purposeful, he operates like this. And I need you to remember this. He works in the means because he has determined the ends. Or if you'd like to uh, flip that over, he has determined the ends, so he works in the means. You see, he has promised his people that one day they would get home that they would be home. And he is going to work through circumstances to bring about what he has promised, you see. And here, what, he, he, what had he determined? A land. And what means would he, he work through to bring that about? Warfare. You see, these characteristics qualify God to work in a way that's utterly unique to him. And I'll tell you why. Because he is not the type of God who makes plans and then has them falter or fail. James actually says that's actually typical of you and me. That we are beholden to circumstances outside of our control, aren't we? And James, at one point, he says, you know what? He's like, remember, when you're planning things, remember this fundamental assumption that you have no control over anything. He actually says... You don't even have the will to make yourself make sure you're alive the next day. And so he says, you ought to say, if God wills. And, he's, and it, what the, the, it's the fundamental 
reshaping of our mind that the that that God has all the control and we have none of it. And therefore, our plans, we should make our plans with the understanding that God will either see them through or he will not. That's why Paul in Ephesians 1 makes this great statement. Ephesians 1.11, you can mark it down. It says that speaking of God, it says he, that who works all things according to the counsel of his will. In other words, his will determines what he works in. And it says he works through all things. So his will determines what he works in to accomplish his will. He has all the authority. He is personal. He is powerful. He is purposeful. And by the way, that is not the pre prevailing uh, view of God today, is it? You think about it, Orthodox Christianity, Orthodox theology, he has always held this, that God is both transcendent, meaning that he's, far, he's, he's in the spiritual realm, he could be un, he's unknown because of that, and he is far from his creation, and he's also eminent in, in that he's among his creation, and he works in our lives and works in the lives of his people, so he's near, he's far and near. But then with the age of uh, the, the Enlightenment, deism began to uh, gain popularity. And that took away the eminence. That, that said this, that God is so far, he is only transcendent, and therefore we can't really know him. And as a result, we have to go through life making our own way because God's way out there, and that's just us now down here. And then if you move, move through history, then you have secularism, whereby it says, you know, we really can't know who God is. We, um, it's really, you can worship who you want, but just don't make it a definite thing because we really don't know. And then now, especially in the young people, I would, I'll, I've addressed this to my, my oldest daughter, Gracie. Right now, the theology is, this, is called moralistic, therapeutic deism. You should look that up, parents, because that's what your, your kids are learning in, in, in culture right now. And that pretty much makes the idea of God, is he's, he's a cosmic butler. And that is this, God's nice, so he wants you to be nice. And God's number one goal for you is to be happy. And you can leave him out of your life, but whenever you need him, call on him because he's your cosmic butler. That is what's being perpetrated today. And in here, what we are seeing in, verse, in this very little verse, God is saying no. To the secular, he says, no, I can be known. My name is Yahweh and I am God. And this, and to, to the deist, he says, no, I am not only far, but I am near. You cannot go through the globe and not see my fingerprints upon what I've made. I am not only far, but I am near and I'm among you. And then to the moralistic, therapeutic deist, he says, you know what? My main goal for you is not happiness. I cannot be your cosmic butler because I declare the ends of things. I am concerned about destinations, not how about you feel about things. You see, I love... Um, it's, it's, it's probably this, what I'm trying to tell you is probably best illustrated in a movie that I, I've watched and I, I, I watch whenever I can on the sh when I get time. It's called The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I'm sure some of you guys have saw it, but basically the, the, the main character is a man named Benjamin Button. And what's curious about him is that he was born with age. He was born old. So when he was a toddler, he was in a wheelchair. And he had to fight all the, all the, the, the challenges that he that any person who would be who was advanced in age. So he was born old, but then he had this friend named Daisy, and Daisy was his best friend growing up. And towards the end of the story, Daisy they separate. Daisy is in Paris. Daisy is um, a professional dancer. Benjamin's in New Orleans where he lives, and. Um, an injury happens to Daisy that forces her to no longer be a professional dancer, and it kind of reunites her with Benjamin, who had been separated, who she'd been separated from. And this one scene captures what I'm saying. And so let me just tell you, Benjamin narrates a scene, and this is how it goes. Like, picture this. There's a woman in Paris who needs to leave to go shopping. But as she walks out, she, re she remembers that she's forgotten her coat. So she goes into the, into, back into her house to get her coat. And at that very second, a phone rings, her phone rings. And she stops to have a conversation with, on the phone. And then after she, she gets off the phone, she walks back outside. 
and she hails a cab. Now, a cab was just in the area because the cabbie who was driving, he wanted a cup of coffee. So because he was in the area and there was a shop there, the cabbie was really close to her. And so the cabbie comes and picks her up. So as she's, the cabbie is dri- the taxi is driving with uh, this woman, he has to throw on his brakes because acro- running across the street, there was a man who, was, who had darted out in traffic because he forgot to set his alarm clock um, the night before, and now he was running late for work. And so and after they, the man clears, the, the taxi drives on, she finally gets to the shop that she needed to go. She goes inside, and she, re, and she asks the, the employee for the gift that she had ordered. But the employee informs her, you know what, that she had broken up with her boyfriend the night before, and she'd forgotten to wrap the gift. And so now the woman is waiting for the gift to be wrapped. And so while everything is happening, Daisy is off here in the, in the, the ballet studio getting ready to leave. So the woman gets her gets her gift, gets back in the taxi, and he drives off again. But down the road, a truck had pulled in front of him, and it meant that they had to stop and go around the truck. Now, just as, now just as when that, that taxi was going around that truck, Daisy was walking out of the studio, and as they, they, go, down the, as they go down the road, Daisy walks out, and bam, that taxi hits Daisy. Her leg is broken. Her dancing career is over. No more Paris. Now she's on a collision course to meet Benjamin again. And in that scene, it makes the point of this, that if not one of those things didn't happen, if one of those things did not happen, their lives would have been separated forever. They never would have been married. If a man would have forgotten if the woman did not forget to wear a coat, she ne- Daisy never would have been affected by it. If the man would have remembered to, to set his alarm, Daisy would never would have had alarms broken. But it all happened. And the quote that Benjamin said, um, makes when, he's, when this, this scene is being um, just, uh, shown, it says, he says this, that life is a series of intersecting lives and incidents out of anyone's control, end quote. And you see what God would say in this. God would look at Benjamin Button and say, you know what, you're half right and you're half wrong. That yes, life does seem like it's intersecting lives. Yes, life does seem like it's just a series of incidents. But you are wrong in assuming that it's out of anyone's control. Do you see? The fact that we have a personal God, that we have a powerful God, that we have a purposeful God, means this, that we are not beholden to fate. That you are not dependent upon luck or chance, or coincidence, or that you're not an accident. That all things are under the hand of God who is working his purposes in and among us little by little. Through the ordinary things of life become God's purposes. They come to fruition. Magnify this great God. Not the God that is, that is waiting on us, a God that has no power, that chooses not to exercise authority. Magnify the God who, as Isaiah says, declares the end from the beginning. He is that great God who chooses to work little by little. So, you were patient, Daryl. That will be the doctrinal part. Now let's get kind of practical. So that's God. He is a God who, has, who wields ultimate power, determines his purpose, his plan, and makes sure it comes to pass, and yet he's involved in, in life, in our lives. And so the question is, what does this all mean for me? Especially if I, as I face the year 2021, this new, st- this new year. Well, the first of all, this verse teaches us something about life, doesn't it? And it is this, that God, since God works little by little, Listen, he may seem slow, but he is never late. God may seem slow, but he is never late. See, although God does work miraculously, like like through the healing of doctors when they say that the doctors say there's no chance, God will sometimes overrule a doctor's ability and he will see that through and he will he will work miraculously. Or when you escape a car accident that should normally kill someone or severely injure them, without a scratch, or God works through dramatic conversions of people, he often chooses to work slowly. And Peter had something interesting to say about this. In 2 Peter 3, verse 9, he said this, God, 
God is, is not slow, or the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. And he adds this, as some count slowness. In other words, Peter is saying, don't interpret God's slowness with your own human experience. Right? Because when we think someone is late, or when th- something is moving more slowly than we ought, what do we deduce? Well, that that person has forgotten about us. Or that person has maybe promised something that is out that they can't deliver. Or maybe there are forces acting upon that person who are making it impossibly different for, difficult for them to even deliver their promise. And w- because God is personal and powerful and purposeful, we know this, that God's slowness does not mean that he's forgotten you. That God's slowness, slowness does not mean that he's delivered something that he or promised something that he can't deliver. God's slowness does not mean that he's delayed by things out of his control. If you like, when it comes to God working slowly, we need to remember this, that God's slowness is purposeful slowness. It's purposeful. And I say that to teach you this or to remind you of this, that there are some things that you and I have prayed for in 2020 that you're going to have to continue to pray for in 2021. Jesus taught this when he talked about praying. He said, ask, seek, and knock. But he did not say ask once, seek once, knock once. It's continual action, meaning prayer is not something that you pray for, just go look at the door to see if it's going to get delivered like Amazon. That there are things with God where he moves on a different timetable with us and that we must be patient and persistent in our prayer. You see, life is God's working in our life is going to be slow sometimes. And let me warn you that it is exactly in those times when the Christian is most vulnerable to dangerous error. And I'll tell you why. You got to just look at when it was Abram and Sarai. Oh, uh, Abram, Abram, God told us that we're going to have a child years ago. And look at all this time that's passed. Go, there's Hagar. You go take care of it that way. I'm tired of being patient. And sometimes, the, the, in these moments in, in, in life, the temptation for the Christian is going to be to figure things out yourselves and to move ahead of for God. There's danger in that, so you need to be aware of that. That's life. God, in his sovereignty, chooses to work slow in our lives. So he is slower than we like, but he'll never be late. And then... It teaches us something about ourselves, right? What do we need? If we are living under the, under the governance of a God who works things out, determines the ends, and he works for the means to get there, how, what do we need in life to just keep ourselves sane, right? If, if, if we really have no control over things and God's the one superintending everything, governing this creation, how, does, how should I live then? Well, number one, we need wisdom, don't we? Notice because verse 22, we haven't left verse 22. Notice that verse 22 is paradoxical. Notice that on one hand, God would be the one who would ensure victory in battle. Notice um, he will, Lord will put those nations out. But then, and yet, he would not do it apart from the work of his people. Notice, you may not. So on one side, we have God seem like he's going to be doing it. And on the other hand, on the other side, it's saying you can't do it. It's implying that you have, you have some say in this. And the wisdom that we need is this, that God appears to be the one that would win the battles. And yet in the same statement, it appears that the people would be the ones winning it. And what we're learning here is this, that the people, upon hearing that God would fight on their behalf and defeat their enemies, could not alleviate themselves of the responsibility of fighting. Can you imagine this? I wish I the I wish we, if we were on TV, I'd go sit down and and uh, demonstrate this for you. But can you imagine the day of battle for these people, for the Israelites? The commander is coming. He's got all of his regalia on and his armor, and he goes into the troop encampment, and all of his guys are on the couch checking Facebook, right? And he says to him, what are you doing? We have to bat- We have a battle today. We have to fight. Oh, no. It says he, God says he will do it little by little. God will do it through the work of your sword and through the weapons and through your training. Do you see? 
that God being in control and governing our lives does not call us to an action or to indecision or to plain stupidity. That God says, yes, I will do it, but it will only happen when you put in the work. You see, this is why you don't, when you're, if you and your husband and wife or you're trying, you're thinking about moving a house, this is why you don't go out to the front yard and look for a sign, one of those planes with the banners that says, that says, sell your house. God's not going to send one of those. You know why? Because God would say, okay, if you want to think about selling your house, hire a realtor. Because that's the person I've given the knowledge about all this stuff. Crunch the numbers. Do the math. You decide. I'm not going to send you a sign on this. And, all, and for, I know we got a lot of younger people, so just remember this, guys, that if you're trying to go on a date, look decent. Because some girl, guys, boys, Landon and Nathan, you guys out there, girls are not going to wake up one day hypnotized and automatically just want to marry you. You have to work for it. You know, and if your mind is not that, that developed, then go to the gym. There's a saying in the gym, more plates, more, more weights, more dates. Take some responsibility in your own life. This is what God would say. Don't go off looking for these extraordinary miracles. Don't go saying, well, God is going to lead my path. As though you're going to wake up and God's going to override your will and turn you into a robot and drive you into a, a direction that you normally wouldn't. No. It means if you're going to get good grades, you need to work. That means if you're going to have a productive life, you need to work hard. Because God is not here off in the, in the, in the background saying, I'm going to create this, this, this lush life for you, and you just kick back and relax. If you understand, if you th believe that the doctrine of God's providence and sovereignty leads you to that, that just shows you that it's wrong. If you step in front of a train, God's providence says that you will die. You are not more spiritual for thinking, oh, well, if it's his will that I die. Well, we'll have that talk later. You get the point. We need wisdom in this. Don't go through life being, a, being fatalistic or humanistic. Wisdom. But not only do we need wisdom, we need faith. And I'll tell you why. Because... If faith initiates us into the Christian life, which it does, if it makes if we are faith in the gospel in Christ, it also sustains us. And I'll be brief, but you think about this. Why is it that we believe like we do? I am only have been a Christian for 20 years, about, and I've seen Christians go through things that have happened to them with such grace. Things that would undo anyone else. I've watched Christians be sustained and say, I don't understand why this has happened, but I believe God in it. And their lives have been sustained in that and stabilized. And yet to other people, I've seen them fall and fall. Why? What is it about us that makes us go on despite things? It's a fact that we believe that God works little by little in the small things. You see, that's why you pray for your meals. When you don't pray for your meals, it might be the assumption that you, would, you think that you've gotten all that. You see, God has designed life for even the little things and are the big things. Like when I taste a cup of coffee in the morning, oh, God is good. He's designed coffee beans to taste like this. But yet, and also there's purpose in the, in the hard things, too like my dad being in the hospital. You see, we believe in Romans 8.28, which is essentially the New Testament restating of Deuteronomy 7.22. What's Romans 8.28 say? We know that all things, for th that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to the purpose. You know what? A lot of Christians have butchered that because they forgot one word in that, in that verse. Can you please under, under, underline it? It's the word together. When something bad happens to you, a Christian or someone, the Christian should not be going up to them and saying, all things are good as if that bad thing is good. That's not what God's saying. That's not what Paul said. 
What Paul is doing, he's, he's giving us a picture of God. He's saying, you know what? God is like a master artist. And the portrait of your life that he's creating, that he's painting, he's paint with every little detail of your life, it's another stroke. It's another stroke. It's another stroke. And God says that the end result of that will be good. But not the singular events, all of them. That the total of our lives, the total detail of our lives, is something that God says is good, will be good. That's why faith is the assurance of what uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1, I like how one version states that it's the assurance of what we do not see. Faith is God's working for us, and it characterizes our lives. Jeremiah Burroughs, and I'm done. I was thinking about this. Jeremiah Burroughs was an English Puritan, and he wrote the book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, and he describes our lives like this and why we why we are how we are in in relation to god he says this quote we look at things by pieces we look at one detail and do not consider the relation that one thing has to another but god looks at all things at once and sees the relation of one thing to another in other words if you can picture your life as being a chain a, a chain where every, every circumstance and every event in your life is one link in that chain. Jeremiah Burroughs says the problem is that we only see one link at a time. And we get to the end of our rope, so to speak, the end of our chain, our, our chain and we say, well, what's going to happen next? I don't know where God's going to work in this. And next comes that next event, that next chain. And the thing that causes us stress is because there's distance between the, those chain links. But Burroughs says, no, no, no. Don't think that God looks at your life like you look at your life, where you see one event after another and you don't know how they're related. He says, no, remember this, that God sees every event and he sees the exact relation of one thing to another. Um, Bill Murray. Uh, I watch YouTube a lot now since I'm off Facebook. And... Um, this popped in my feet. I don't know why. But Bill Murray, the actor, was at a con uh, press conference. I don't know what the occasion was. And um, he, the, he, a reporter asked him, he said, well, uh, Mr. Murray, what is the role of art in your life? What, have, is you, have you benefited from any type of, of art? What, what role has it played? And Bill Murray went on to tell the story how, uh, as a young actor in Chicago, um, he knew that he was acting so poorly one night that he just simply walked off stage during his set. And he was just so upset with himself and that he began walking around downtown Chicago. And he walked for a couple hours. He said, I finally realized that I was walking in the wrong direction. But then he added, I was walking in the wrong direction physically, but also mentally. He said, I got to a point where I, re I thought that I would just walk towards the lake, jump in, and just end my life because he was in such distress. So I said, as he was walking, he hit Michigan Avenue, and he said he decided for some reason to turn north. And he went north, and he ran into the Chicago Art Museum. And um, he walked in the art museum. He said he, was, he looked so horrible. He said that he walked in, and he saw this picture called The Song of the Lark. And the picture was of a woman, like um, maybe a frontier woman. She's holding a sickle. And she's in a field, and up, she's looking up at something. And in the background, there's a sun, sunrise. And Bill Murray said that when he saw that the sun had risen for that woman, he said, I can go, he said he realized he can go on another day. And it saved his life. And I thought about that, and I thought about this, that the gospel says that our lives have been saved, not because of the rising of the S-U-N, but because of the rising of the S-O-N. You see, God, the matur, master artist, painted his son out of his own picture so that he could paint him into our picture. In other words, Jesus received the judgment the, so that we could be free. Jesus deserved wrath so that we could receive love. And all the privileges that the, these people had in Deuteronomy, these Israelites had, are transferred to us because the Father planned the ends and the son was the means. You see? And we can go through life, the gospel says, knowing that Jesus, because Jesus purchased our standing with God, 
that we are infinitely loved, infinitely cared for, and nothing will be given to you unless it comes from the hand of a good father. The sun rising, the S-O-N, tells you that is so. And on days when it's going to happen this year, remember what I say, when doubt creeps in and um, it feels like fear has overtaken you or faith, or, and you feel like you're faithless, remember this, that Jesus not only died for you, but he lived for you. And what I mean by that is this, that when Jesus was on earth, he perfectly believed the promises of God for you. And God is not pleased by how much you believe in him. He's pleased that when he sees you, he sees his son believing for you. When we feel like we're far from God or that we're doubting, remember this. When darkness hides his lovely face, I rest upon his unchanging grace. Let's pray and we'll sing a song. And now, great God, we... We ask that you would bless your word. We ask that you would seal these things upon our minds as we go through this new year. In Christ's name, amen. As we sing, we start at page 526, The Solid Rock. Page 526. The altar's open if you want to pray. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Verse 2. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. How about verse 4? When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin really bailed me out being here because I wouldn't have to be able to lead singing. We'd have somebody else do that. Now let's uh, remain standing for the benediction. This is uh, something that it means a lot to me, and I want to dismiss you with God's word. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.